Um, ah, yes. Uh, welcome everybody to the, to the second of our uh, general lecture series here at the winter session of the VNYI. Um, this is, we have these lectures Namely, 1231, 1231 p.m. in New York, which is uh, 8.30 p.m. in St. Petersburg, and everybody else can calculate the time for yourself. Um, they're open to the entire school, and they're also streamed on Facebook, uh, if that's okay with the speaker. Um, and yeah. so Oh, that's okay. With you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, they are streamed on Facebook so that people outside of the school who don't attend classes can attend the lecture series. And so welcome to anyone, and you are welcome to tell your friends, colleagues, students, teachers that they can attend the general lectures by going to the school's Facebook page. Uh, and the, all of the general lectures will be there. Um, the lectures are intended for general audience, but they are given by specialists from various fields that are invited to the school. Some are members of our faculty teaching classes, some are not, uh, and they cover a wide range of, of topics. Today, um, we have Matthew Leno from the University of Rochester, who is from the history department, if I am right about that. Um, at the University of Rochester. Uh, and I will now turn it over to Anna Maslinkova, his colleague, yeah. our co-director, and his colleague from the University of Rochester to tell us a little more about Matt. I'll just say that his talk today is about gender um, and the Second World War. Uh, and uh, we very much encourage you, if possible, to keep your cameras on. The reason we, we do this is not so that people look at you but so that it's uh, nicer for the speaker to feel like he or she has an audience rather than looking at a lot of black boxes. So if you are willing to have your camera on, we greatly appreciate it. It's a sign of respect to the speaker, but we also understand, um, and we don't care if you're eating food or have children or cats or birds in the background, you turn off your microphone, um, but it's a very nice thing to have your camera on so the speaker feels that <clears throat> she's speaking to an audience. And now I'll turn it over to Anna Maslinkova, uh, our co-director, who will tell us a little more about Matthew. Uh, I must say that I've known Matthew for many years. As I said, I didn't prepare for uh, today's introduction, so I don't know exactly for how many, but what I know for certain is many. I've heard a lot of lectures given by Matthew Lenau, and I was fascinated by his uh, uh, by his uh, lectures, by their content, and by their vision of Russia. Uh, he focuses on uh, uh, Russian, uh, new Russian history, actually, the, mostly the Soviet history. And uh, uh, one of his books is on Kirov. Uh, I uh, read a little bit of this book, and I had long and extremely interesting conversations with Matt about it. That's about all I can say today. I'm very happy that Matt Leno is joining our institute. So this is where we take our microphones off just for a second. Uh, this is our tradition. So everyone unmute yourself so that we can do actual clapping because it's the one thing we can do that's like real life is clap together. So ready? Please un unmute your microphone. You go to the little okay. thing and welcome our speaker. It can do better than that. Come on. There we go. Thank you very much. So, um, how is my audio? Are you getting any feedback? Yeah, a bit echo. Yeah. Um, is that a problem? It seems to be all right. I'm fine. Okay, good. So let me say a bit more about um, who I am and my work. Um, my first book, which was a development of my dissertation, was on the origins of Stalinist culture within journalism in the 1920s. My second uh, was, as Anna said, on the Kirov murder, titled uh, The Kirov Murder in Soviet History. And I'm now working on a book on the everyday uh, emotions and experiences of Red Army soldiers in World War 
two, particularly the first um, 18 months of, of the war, the, the uh, period of disastrous defeats. So before I begin, um, I think I've got three um, statements I need to make. First of all, I've got a cough, so if you hear me coughing, I apologize. Secondly, I am not a specialist in is relatively new to me. And however, I hope to make it central to my account of the Red Army in World War II and daily life. Third, when I discuss masculinity in this um, article, I'm going to be using some pretty filthy words in both in English and in Russian. And some of you, you know, some of you may be shocked if, if you want to hear some, you know, if, if you don't want to hear some of the worst uh, words in those languages, then you probably, this is a trigger warning and you probably shouldn't attend. Um, but they're ugly words. Uh, it is these days in uh, academia that I'm familiar with, it is acceptable to discuss these words because they are part of language and part of culture and they tell us a lot about those, those things. So uh, onward. My aim today is to explore men's and women's concepts and emotions around gender in the Red Army during the Great Patriotic War. How did members of each gender define their own masculinity and femininity? And how did they understand the identity of the opposite gender? The answers to these questions reveal that men had extraordinarily contradictory understandings of the feminine from passive object of penetration and domination to great respect for women's abilities. Women saw themselves too as highly competent and valuable, but had to maneuver around male sexual aggression. This talk is based on my research, as I said already, into the everyday experiences of Red Army soldiers. The sources that I read, and I should note Red Army soldiers, men and women, because of course, uh, many women serve in the Red Army. The sources that I read include uh, ego documents, such as soldiers' letters home, their diaries and their memoirs, but also German interrogations of Soviet POWs, uh, Red Army morale reports, and folklore collections as well. <clears throat> Most of these documents were produced by men, although there are a few letters and diaries from women soldiers, as well as a very few from civilian women. Thus, I can discern a good deal about interaction between military women and men and about military men's relations with civilian women, but less about civilian women's feelings and attitudes. And I just want to take a quick break here to ask if you're hearing me okay. Is that excellent? During World War II, known to the Russians, of course, uh, and uh, to the Soviets of, of, the, of the time as the Great Patriotic War, around 800,000 women, or about 3% of all personnel, served in the Red Army. This number is not as astronomically high as it is sometimes presented. The US military, for example, deployed almost as many women proportional to total military numbers, about 2% of all personnel. The British and Commonwealth Armed Forces may have had over, or may have been over 5% women. However, the Soviets almost certainly exposed more women to combat by design or otherwise than any other military in modern history. There were trained female combatants, pilots, snipers, anti-aircraft gunners, a few machine gunners and tank drivers, but many more women in combat were medics. 40% of all medics were women, communications personnel, nurses and doctors. In short, men and women soldiers in the Red Army mixed much closer to the front than in other modern armies and indeed at the very front line. Because the presence of service women in combat environments was novel to Soviet culture and indeed to all Western cultures, it both highlighted and challenged existing gender norms. Red Army men and women wrote millions of letters to friends and family at home. 
and um, I will be um, I will be using these letters as sources. And the interactions with civilians between these letters, uh, through these letters, reveal a great deal uh, about gender in Red Army culture and Soviet culture in general. I will not be discussing non-binary gender or same-sex attraction today. Neither are visible in available sources on the military. The universal in assumption in Soviet society, outside a few avant-garde artistic circles, was that a person was either male or female, never both or neither. Homosexuality was known to exist, of course, but despised. Or would, could, or will admit that gay sex was going on in the military. No doubt it was, but until the records of military tribunals are opened, and that won't happen in this century, we will know nothing of them. <clears throat> so I want to proceed to uh, women's, some of women's understanding of themselves. And how did women in the Red Army define themselves as feminine? And how did men understand themselves as masculine? That's what we'll go on to in the second part of the paper. Did the genders agree on what constituted masculine and feminine? And what emotions and attitudes towards their military experience did men and women share? The unpublished diary of Katya Novikova, a young medic in combat in August to September of 1941, is a good entree into our discussion of women's self-identity. Now, Vikova was a high school student, perhaps 18 or 19 years old, working with a team of three other young woman medics whose familiar names or, or uh, diminutive names were Lucia, Lelia, and Olia. From August 17th to 20th of 41, Novikova was in heavy combat, dragging her medical pack through heavy fire to treat wounded soldiers and getting them back to first aid stations. Lucia, a close friend, was mortally wounded. Multiple officers in her unit, men she knew from the regimental command post, including another close friend, Dmitri, died in the battle. There was all kinds of uh, battle trauma that, that Novikova experienced, and, um, including an incident in which one of, the women, one of the wounded she was treating begged her to shoot him. And she reports all of this in her diary very laconically and without any emotional comment. Navikova expressed many emotions and attitudes that we might think of as stereotypically masculine. She reported her work under fire matter-of-factly, omitting any emotional commentary, as I've said. Her reaction to the death of her friends was a fierce desire for revenge laced with profanity. This is a direct quote. The sons of bitches, referring to the Germans. I will avenge all of them, Lucia, Dmitri, the commander. Several days later, she described with seeming joy a German military cemetery her unit had recaptured during a counterattack. Couching her feelings in official phrasing, she wrote, the fascists have found only death on our land. Novikova cried over the deaths of her friends, which in 20th century American culture, that is culture of the last century, at least might have read as feminine. It would not, not necessarily have read so in the Red Army. Many male Soviet soldiers also reported crying, whether at the sight of civilian victims of German atrocities, during a sentimental song at a concert, or upon hearing of the fall of Kiev. As an expression of hatred, love, or grief, crying was acceptable in the army for both men and women. And parenthetically, crying in fear, as uh, Boris Gorbachev reports men do, do, doing during an infantry charge was, was not acceptable. <clears throat> Just as male soldiers in well-trained combat experienced units have tight bonds with their primary groups, the comrades in arms in their own squad or platoon, so did Novikova. The death of her friend and fellow medic Lucia devastated her, as did the deaths of Dmitri and other personnel she'd worked with at the regimental command post. 
On August 29th, during a break in the fighting, she wrote, it's raining out and Oli and I sit in the medical tent, smoking, singing Lucia's favorite songs and remembering her and Dimitri. After an another friend in her group of medics, Lelia, was assigned away and more officers she worked with were killed or wounded, Navikova lamented that there's no one left to support Olya and me. Her primary group was evaporating. In other respects too, Navikova's feelings and attitudes seem a little different from those typical for an exemplary male soldier. She longed for letters from home and was buoyed up when she received them. She felt exceptionally proud when she, Olya, and Lucia were nominated for medals. She missed her friends who were just returning to school on September 1st, but she was simultaneously proud to be at the front. She wrote, the girls must envy me. Finally, when offered a chance to work for a general in Moscow, she, quote, she, referred, she said that she politely refused, choosing to remain with her unit. And I should note that it's, uh, it, it's quite typical for male combatants um, who've been behind, the, who, who get a chance to go behind the lines or are in hospital behind the lines to want to return to the front and to return to their specific unit where they know people who can keep them safer in combat. It's only actually though in this last interaction that Novikova appears uh, particularly as quote unquote feminine. So what am I talking about? On September 2nd at a medical aid station behind the front, she, she ran into uh, a gen, this general she'd already mentioned, and a quote unquote tall commissar she seems to have had a crush on. I got so excited, she wrote, it was just terrible. The general's offer to go to Moscow with him, made one on one with Novikova a few minutes later, may have been made in expectation of a sexual relationship with her, though we cannot be sure. At any rate, she wriggled away, politely refusing. Proud of her ability to do her in job, I'm sorry, proud of her ability to do her job in combat, loyal to her comrades in arms, oppressed by the death of her friends and the gore of the battlefield, eager to avenge herself upon the enemy and full of hatred for the enemy, longing for home, eyes out for the romantic chance, Navikova might as well have been a boy rather than a girl soldier. And I say boy and girl because she herself was only 18 or 19, as, as were many of the male soldiers. It is only that last wriggling away from a possible attempt by a much more powerful male to exploit her that really signifies her as feminine. But it's also worth noting that in this situation, at least, Novikova seems to have felt confident in her ability to handle the general. She shows no signs of feeling herself to be a quote unquote weak woman. The portrait that I have painted of Novikova fits well with the scholar Anna Krilova's argument in a book called Soviet Women in Combat, that highly educated female specialists in the military did not see their role as soldier as in any way contradictory to their feminine identities. Soldiers in these women's minds could equally well be men or women, and that was all. There's much to be said for Krilova argue, Krilova's argument, as further examples, further examples will show. However, two points about Novikova suggest that we have to qualify Krilova's claims. First, Novikova was a medic in a caretaking role. She may have carried a sidearm, but her primary role was not to kill the enemy. Most women in the Red Army who experienced combat were, like Novikova, medical personnel. Comparatively few were trained at combat per se, and it is these few that Krilova focuses her work on. For most Red Army women, though, being in combat meant being a caretaker and healer, not a killer, and it was gender as a cultural category that slotted them into this role. Novikova, it seems, would have happily been a killer after her friend's death. 
Second, Novikova had to navigate male attention and the male-female power imbalance. Many Red Army women had to deal with much worse along these lines, from constant sexual harassment to outright rape. As much as anything else, women were defined as feminine in Red Army culture and in Soviet society by men's power to determine when and with whom to have sex. Part of being a woman was working with, evading, or accepting that power. This is where Krilova's work is weaker, for she insists that most sexual relations at the front were consensual and minimizes both rape and sexual harassment. The letters of Elena Dykman to her mother illustrate what young educated women valued in themselves and the mazes of sexual desire and coercion they had to run in the trenches. Dykman's father was an old Bolshevik, the son of a rich, and the old Bolshevik, her father, was the son of a rich merchant in Odessa. Her father had held high posts in the Soviet government until his arrest during the Great Terror in 1937. In other words, she was, and, and in an odd way remained, a member of the, the highest Soviet elite. Born in 1921 or 1922, Dykman attended model school number 167 in Moscow, where many central government elites sent their children. She then matriculated to the history department of Moscow State University, but resigned to go to nursing school upon the outbreak of the war. Upon graduation, she was assigned to a rear hospital in Sredlovsk. Yet she constantly applied for frontline duty and eventually got some in the summer of 1942. Dykman went missing in action in the last days of the war in May of 1945. So we have a whole, we have a, a hundred letters of Dykman's correspondence with her mother and a few letters uh, to her father. In May of 1942, she wrote to her mother to explain why she had pressed for a position near the front. Of course, her mother was worried about her. Mama, Truly, you wanted to bring me up as a young communist, a good worker, a patriot. Isn't that right? Now that I have arrived on the spot that is just behind the front, I am going with such eagerness to work. And this is not just romanticism, Mama. And you know that sooner or later they would mobilize me anyway. Do you understand, Mama, that being here is for me absolutely necessary? I would not have ever forgiven myself for failing to participate in the war. How my face would redden with shame, yes, with shame, if we should all stand to drink in honor of the victory and the defenders of the motherland. You understand that if I did not go, it would cast a shadow on my whole life. Here Dykeman stakes her future on her identity as a patriot and defender of the motherland, as a conscientious and highly competent person doing her duty for society. In the same letter, she tries to reassure her mother that her new hospital is still behind the front, that she's well-fed, healthy, and well-clothed. So even as she's seeking out danger and adventure, she's also trying to um, assuage her family's worries. Dykeman consistently expressed pride in her skills, toughness, and organizational capabilities. In a July 19, 1942 letter, she told her mother that she had picked up domestic skills that she had never learned at home, such as sewing, laundry, bed making, and mattress cleaning. Apparently her mother had done all these things for her at home. But she was even more pleased about her growing ability to endure discomfort. She bragged to her mother that she had become stronger, tanned, that she could sleep in hay or on a cart, go about for days in wet boots, bear the cold, and eat anything. In a fashion we might think of as typically, quote unquote, masculine, Dykeman was curious about and eager to experience combat. Now stationed a few dozen kilometers from the front, she had seen smashed empty pillboxes, anti-tank ditches, and crashed German aircraft. She had also seen dead Germans and wrote a bit demonstratively, an enemy corpse always smells good. The detritus of battle made Dykeman want the full experience. I would like, she wrote, not just to see battle, but to take part in an attack. 
On August 5, 1942, Dykeman wrote in excitement to her mother of her baptism of fire. Mama, I have already had a three-day baptism of fire. There was a battle, quite fierce, bullets, wounded, the ambulance, what a crazy ride. Binding wounds under the whistle of shells and bullets, lying on the ground, unable to raise one's head. But my job was, for the most part, secondary bandaging and transport of the wounded. She also complained to her mother that due to censorship, the press had not yet covered the exploits of her unit, which was, quote, carrying out its assigned tasks with honor. So um, this unit identity, this strong identity uh, that well-trained soldiers often feel uh, towards their unit, uh, with their unit, uh, is also something we think of as, as male soldiers feeling. Over the next two years, Dykeman sought with success more and more dangerous assignments. Turning down an opportunity to leave the army and return to Moscow State, she made it into a frontline artillery unit where she learned to fire an automatic pistol she took into combat. Eventually, she hoped to join an infantry reconnaissance group, a nearly suicidal assignment. But in 1943, she was wounded in the shoulder and sent back to Moscow to recuperate. In January 1944, Dykeman returned to her old unit. Like many combat veterans, she was thrilled to be once more with my own family. And those are her words. Never before, she wrote, have I felt myself loved by those around me so dear to all who know me as here. As in Novikova's case, we see here that the bond of shared combat that links so many male veterans held to for women. For reasons that are unclear, soon after her return, Dykeman began writing to both her parents about sexual relations in the army and the difficulties she herself had had. In a January 1944 letter to her father, Dykeman noted that, quote, the majority of the girls in the unit and among them, there are many good people and good workers, have here mar married officers who live with them and care for them. I'm sorry, they have married officers who live with them and care for them. And all the same, these are temporary, impermanent marriages, because each of them has at home a family and children and does not plan to leave them. It is just simply that it is difficult to live at the front without tenderness and all alone. This description is notable first because it makes the woman's role as caretakers for men clear. It also suggests that while Soviet military women nearly always claimed they expected to marry the men they were in frontline relationships with, in fact, many, under, many understood such relationships as temporary, just as most, most men did. In the same letter, Dykeman claimed that she herself had won respect by being the exception, having no romantic slash sexual relationships. She noted a joke going around that equated the medal for wartime services, Zabayavuya Zaslugi, on a woman's chest with for sexual services, Zapalyavuya Zaslugi. One had to behave with great circumspection to avoid such innuendo, she said. And she feared that after the war, all women who had served would be viewed as promiscuous. Sadly, she was correct about this. Five months later, in June, July of 1944, Dykeman described in a series of letters man trouble she had experienced since her return to the front. A captain in her regiment had begun courting her, but soon, quote, his crude approaches and open desire made me revolted. He nonetheless continued to invite her to quote unquote parties at the regimental commander's headquarters. One evening, he even sent the commander's auto over with an adjutant and order that Dykeman attend a party. Fleeing into the night, she sought shelter with another captain, a friend who seems to have protected her from the harasser. Dykeman began spending time with a new captain, probably as a way of avoiding her stalker. They became friends and eventually lovers. However, he quickly became possessive, ordering Dykeman around, trying to restrict her movements, and seeking to turn her into what she called his housewife. 
When she refused to accept his orders, he withdrew. When it turned out Dykeman was pregnant, his response was, quote, you weren't the first and you won't be the last. She decided to get an abortion. By this time, Dykeman's unit was in Romania. Army officers refused her an abortion, so she tried quinine, a measure known to all girls in the medical battalion, she wrote, which failed and left her temporary deaf, temporarily deaf. She set out on a journey through the Romanian countryside in search of a doctor who would perform an abortion. She was sick, partially deaf, still suffering from the after effects of her wound, pregnant and ignorant of the local language. Eventually, she headed back to Ukraine, to Kharkov, where a friend had recommended a doctor. Though she did not have enough money to pay in full, he did the operation, she supposed out of pity for her. Dykeman's stories I'm sorry, Dykeman's story drives home the points I drew from Novikova's. Dykeman saw herself as a soldier, a patriot, and an adventurer. She prided herself on her resilience, toughness, skills, sense of duty, and ability to endure combat. As Krilova suggests, it did not occur to her that such traits were masculine or that being a soldier was unwomanly. It was male expectations that she heal and caretake that prevented her from going into battle as a fully armed and trained combatant. And contra Kolova, it was also male aggression and sexual irresponsibility that made her life miserable in the spring of 1944. So it would be hard to overestimate the extent of sexual harassment and rape women were exposed to in the Red Army. Alexandra Zdanova, a young military doctor, for example, had to pull her pistol on a senior officer who assaulted her. So um, one of the things I do not have time in this paper to discuss is that educated women with specialties in disciplined units had resources which uh, often enabled them to evade unwanted sexual attention. They uh, were protected by other officers uh, who needed their specialties and, um, and, and in disciplined units, um, the command was effective at doing this. It's probable and, and almost certain that uh, less educated women in jobs like uh, who, who were typists, laundresses, sometimes medics with the combat units, um, had many fewer options for dealing with um, male sexual aggressiveness. And um, that, is a, that is a whole another story which I can't tell here. So I've referred twice now to women being forced into caretaking roles in the military, mostly medical roles. Dykeman definitely was, she would rather have been a combatant Navikova may also have desired to be a combatant. At one point, she mentions her desire to take an officer up on his offer to take her into battle in an armored car. Many women nurses, doctors, and medics, however, invested themselves completely in the saving of wounded and derived deep satisfaction from these soldiers' gratitude. Viera Yevdokimova, a young medic on the Leningrad front in the summer and fall of 1941, described how saving the wounded became an all-consuming task, blocking out any thought or even sensation of the battle raging round about. She wrote, at times it was very hard for us. After all, we had to pull the wounded with us on a crawl. You couldn't raise yourself up at all, otherwise you'd be killed. But we were so focused on the process of saving the wounded that we paid no attention to the fact that the battle was boiling around us. We had to save the wounded. Valentina Kamushnikova, another teenage medic, recalled in old age how she had been wounded in a Ukrainian cornfield in September of 1941, shot by a sniper through the pelvis. In the course of her travel back to a hospital in Kharkov, her stretcher bearers were unable to get her onto a train. A cavalry captain, for whom she had bandaged a bad hand wound in, wound in the first days of the war, recognized her. Then she remembered 
he wouldn't leave me. And he was telling everyone, I'm not going until you take this girl too. She's my savior. Eventually she got on the train. Another medic, Yudmila Vaskovai, actually I'm gonna get the, um, I'm gonna get the, uh, the uh, stress wrong in this last name. Uh, Vaskovaya, Vaskovaya, was a 25 year old teacher when the war broke out. She moved to hospital work in the rear and later became a, a combat medic. In March 1942, she wrote tenderly to a friend of her work with the wounded, who she called my pets, Pitomtsi. Now it is night. I am on duty at the hospital. All of my pets are sleeping. I decided to use this free, mi free minute. It is hard for wounded soldiers to sleep. They groan, I'm sorry, they groan. They groan, they pant, they rave in their delirium. And I try to raise their suffering, ease their suffering as much as I can. I work in the toughest department, post-op. I've made many friends among the soldiers. Vaskovaya died on May 13th. 1943, hit by a mortar shell while trying to reach a wounded soldier. She was buried with full military honors together with other soldiers killed in the attack. So let's proceed to a discussion of masculinity and men's views of women. How did male soldiers un understand themselves to be masculine and women as feminine? The first thing to note is that being a man, man meant having a penis. Now this sounds like a truism, but I don't mean it in a biological sense, but in a cultural one. Obscenities and obscene jokes swapped among Red Army men confirm the absolute centrality of the phallus and its penetrative power to their masculinity. While this was, and probably is, a common theme in soldiers' mentality, soldiers' mentalities, my estimation is that it was more extreme in the Soviet Army than others for which I have some evidence, such as the American and Canadian. Like the pre-war sexual jokes excavated by Jonathan Waterlow, many obscene Red Army jokes, chastushki, um, which we might translate as limericks or couplets, and terms of abuse centered on phallic penetration, which signified domination of women. Passive or effeminate men and the enemy and the enemy were in these utterances contemptible and weak as women and to be similarly dominated. The examples collected by folklorists of these Shastushki are relentlessly one note. Kamandir Khadil Fataku, Pakaril on Vusatu, Yob Sviazist Kuchere Saraku, Ivanyayat Zaverstu. So, rough English translation. The officer assaulted and he took the heights. He fucked the radio girl in the ass and it stank for miles. So, pretty crude. The obsession with penetration and domination of women in Red, in Red Army obscenity sharply separated the soldier from the home, the civilian, and the feminine. It was a key aspect of male of, of Red Army male warrior identity, defined, as Stephen Jugg has so ably shown, against supposedly worthless women and also um, rear rats and officers. The enemy was also to be fucked, just as women or effeminate men were. Pilots in one Soviet fighter regiment referred to the Falk Wolf 189, a sturdy German reconnaissance aircraft, as the Babkina Pizda, I'm sorry, or old lady's cunt, because it could take a lot of punishment. Or, as another Chastushka put it, Mui fascistskava vayaku, mie pustim vradimi krov, paluci huyaku straku, i nie perni buts darov. We will not let you, fascist beast, into the land dear to our hearts. So take my cock right in your asshole and be so good as not to fart. Obscenity clearly shows how male soldiers saw mastery of sex as superiority demonstrated through phallic thrust. Victory too, they often imagined as forceful penetrative sex. Obscene phallic displays and stories also constituted for men a way to symbolically overcome death. In an interview featured in the documentary film, Russia, Blood Upon the Snow, a Stalingrad veteran describes how during a firefight, one of his comrades ran out of ammunition, jumped onto the trench parapet, dropped, dropped his pants and grabbed his member, 
flaunting it at the Germans and yelling, here, come and get it. Whether or not the story was actually true, it meant that real men with stiff phalluses cared for nothing, not even death. Another story centered on phallic power comes from the veteran Nikolai Nikulin, who heard it from a unit comrade who was hitting the penis with shrapnel. On the operating table, the doctor told him, it's nothing, we'll amputate. I'll die with him rather than live without him, the soldier cried, refusing to accept the amputation. In the upshot, he was sent to a female specialist who stitched him back together. As a scientific exper experiment, the doctor then told him to test the results on local women. The, the, the soldier went about experimenting with his rejuvenated equipment with various different local women. The centrality of phallic penetration to male identity prompted many Red Army men to behave with extreme sexual aggression towards women up to and including sexual assault. Indeed, men's insistence on their right to any woman they wanted blurred the line between pressure for sex and rape. The diary of Nikolai Ivanov, an office worker and artist who served in the paratroopers and the artillery, epitomizes this issue. Ivanov was a Don Juan whose self-regard grew in proportion to the number of women he slept with. While stationed in Saratov in the winter of 1941 to 1942, Ivanov was engaged in simultaneous sexual relations with three different young women, although he had a girlfriend at home. This behavior, many of us today would view as ethical, provided all parties involved had full knowledge in this, and of the situation and consented to it. It is doubtful, however, that this was so. But the really problematic part of Ivanov's adventures was his dalliance with one of the Saratov girls, Maria. Ivanov, who was 30, was determined to sleep with Maria, 19, who was resistant. Over the course of five days, he nonetheless pressured her to have sex. On January 22nd, 1941, he got her alone and pressed her, as he put it. In his words, Maria begged for mercy, and he granted it. In his diary, Ivanov admonished himself for excessive liberalism, as he put it. Five days later, he forced Maria to surrender to me, in his words. In classic misogynistic fashion, he was upset by the possibility that she had not been a virgin. By today's standards, it is very hard to see Ivanov's behavior as anything other than rape. And even if most Red Army soldiers, men and women alike, did not see it as such, it is clear that Maria was pressured into sex that she was deeply uncomfortable about. Both civilian and military women had to navigate the sexual pressure of Red Army men like Ivanov or simply, quote unquote, surrender to them. At the same time, men could fear women's sexual agency. Women in the army did desire men and entered into consensual relationships as Dykeman's letters suggest. These encounters ranged from relatively extended cohabitation to hurried one-time sex. Men often felt powerful before women's allure, feared women's supposedly voracious sexual hunger and griped constantly about what they saw as women's use of sex to gain privileges and evade danger. Above all the rank and files, the rank and file resented officers' superior access to women and blamed that on the women themselves. One couplet ran as follows. Nadele minye tomate i prakisla malako, a galad nie soldati hui ne sunut glubako. So in rough English translation, I'm sick of tomatoes and the milk is soured and hungry soldiers can't get their dicks in deep. So this is the complaint supposedly of a woman. Red Army men's obsessive anxiety that wives and girlfriends in the rear would betray or leave them stemmed in large part from this fear of sexual agency and women's sexual agency. There were, however, countercurrents that existed or coexisted with male misogyny. Red Army men with families and children consistently expressed confidence in their wives' ability to manage financial affairs, emotional issues, and domestic tasks while succeeding at work. 
In his letters home, for example, Anatoly Manzuk, a miner serving in the officer corps, regularly assured his wife of his faith that she could cope with family decisions and make major decisions for all. Vierechka, he wrote, with our property, including my own, do what you find to be necessary as long as it helps your health. Remember that it is not clear when the war will end, so you should hold something in reserve. Father's attitudes towards their daughters also demonstrated a respect for female confidence, resilience, and potential. For example, in one, letters, one letter home, guards captain Abram Gild told his daughter Lida to take care of her younger sister, help her mother out, and study hard. When the war ends, he wrote, we'll send you to university and you will undoubtedly become a doctor. Again, I, I also want to note here um, the respect that many soldiers seem to have had for the women medics who saved their lives on the battlefield. So I don't want to go on uh, too long. Again, there's a topic here that, uh, that I don't have time to get into, which is that the all of all of this uh, these gender attitudes are complicated by um, the relative by the hierarchy. So Red Army officers had a very, very different experience and very different attitudes, including towards women uh, from the rank and file and the non-commissioned officers. So in conclusion, I would say that men in the Red Army uh, were fundamentally more insecure than women. They simultaneously respected and had contempt for women, demonstrating a, a fear and, and loathing which reflected this insistent on phallic, insistence on phallic dem, domination and fear of women's sexual agency. Women saw themselves as competent and capable, even in spheres traditionally closed off to them. At the same time, and this is something Kilova misses, they had to constantly maneuver around male sexuality. Now, I haven't had to, uh, had, had, in this paper, I haven't presented evidence in this regard, but I have some. In the face of this, uh, of male sexual pushiness or aggression, women um, often viewed themselves as skilled manipulators, able to evade this pressure because their mastery, they could master gullible men, or as resilient survivors uh, when they uh, were forced into sexual relations that they didn't otherwise desire. So that is the, that is the paper. And I do wanna leave time for questions. There's a lot to be discussed here uh, that I haven't had time to discuss. Thank you. So now we can do this again. If our speaker before we go to some questions is on mute, it's the nicest way to do it. Uh, and we do have uh, 10, 15 minutes for any questions or discussion. So um, people can, there may be some in the chat and people can uh, raise your hand in real life or the little um, automated hand or just speak up and I, you can probably see those. I don't see any in the chat right now, but uh, anybody? And I'll also be monitoring the Facebook live stream and see if there are any comments on there for questions, so. Great. So maybe I could ask a question <clears throat> to get it going. Uh, Matt, if you can tell us uh, what is, uh, if you predict any results, what are you expecting to get as a result of this paper and this research? So this paper specifically, the the standard complaint about gender history and it's real it's a real one is that it's put aside in a block it's there'll be like a chapter in a book 
uh, about Russian history on gender history, that it's not integrated into historical narratives. Um, and, and that's odd because, uh, you know, the category of gender is fundamental to culture, society, and even to things like economics. So this paper is really the earliest um, systematic exploration of what I want to say about gender. And I think it provides me, I think that this framework may provide me with a way that I can, dis I can in include gender dynamics throughout the book. So when I'm discussing men's, I'm sorry, not men's, soldiers' relationships with their families in one chapter, uh, as reflected in letters, I can, I can bring in part of these, these gender ideas. And then that would also apply to um, discussions of combat. You know, there will be a chapter on combat. So um, that's where this paper uh, fits right now into the process of writing the book. I, I, <clears throat> I, if no one else has one right now, I actually have a question. Um, <clears throat> it's the sources. So it was, it was people's diaries, I gather. Or yep. Letters after the after the war is that it? Yep. Um, what? It, but the sources were all from the that you talked about at least I think were all women women. Uh, and but what about sort of on the same issues from men's diaries and reminiscences afterwards? But on these same issues, what did you find there? Or of course, okay. many of the men didn't survive. I understand that. But. Well, I, I did use male sources um, for the discussion of masculinity. Um, much more of the paper is devoted to uh, female sources. And here's how that happened. I was, I was getting ready to start the paper on masculinity, which is easy because I've got astronomically more sources from men. And... And, you know, this, this business where so much of, of, of masculinity is centered on the phallus, um, sort of, you can organize the paper around that, right? But then I was thinking that's always what we do, right? We start, we, we go to the men first and then the feminine is presented as somehow reactive. So I thought, well, I need to push back against that and start with the women. So most of the paper ended up um, based, uh, based on the women, but there's, there's a tremendous amount to um, say about masculinity, men's understanding of their role as um, protector of the family. Um, that there's much to say here, but it, it is, as you note, know, it's, it's only about a third or less of the paper. I see, yeah, thank you. Uh, Tanya, I think, has a question. Okay, uh, do you hear me? Yes, I can. Hello, and thanks for the great lecture. You know, I'm thinking um, this great material you are now familiar with, um, except from this, I would say, rather expected um, uh, reproductions of certain ideas of uh, men and women, or maybe change, uh, challenging them, but still thinking in these categories, makes me ask uh, how this extraordinary experience of fighting in the Second World War in the Red Army, uh, to which extent uh, could it open other avenues for all these men and women maybe to, um, you know, identify themselves, appreciate themselves and imagine themselves across these expected gendered lines? Right. So, um... Yes, in many ways, what I find is, uh, is as you would say, expected or, or it's congruent with what we think about Western gender categories in general. Um, I do think that one of the things that is new, or I think it's new, again, I don't know the literature well enough, is this odd, really striking division between um, a deep respect for women's capabilities and, and, and so on, and um, a culture that a culture of sexual assault. And, um, you know, how do you square those things? I haven't had a chance to, to think about that. And I think that something about this, 
I actually think that possibly in Russian Soviet culture, which I know best, um, there was actually a greater respect for women's abilities among men than in um, Western other other Western cultures. At any rate, to get to your question, how could the war have led to reimagining? And um, I haven't thought that out well. Um, Krilova talks about um, women in the 1960s, former combatants, recovering their memory of, of the war and, and really trying to define themselves in memory as part of that victory. Um, but she herself notes that women's experience of combat largely disappears culturally, right? And, and increasingly, you know, right from the 1950s until today, there's this drift in the direction of a cult of female domesticity, um, however we define that. At least that, that would be, that's my broad reading. Mm -hmm. So honestly, um, your question is among the most interesting ones. Um, my own research focuses on the war itself and deepening that experience. So I haven't thought about it. Yeah, if I can just follow up, I, did, I don't think that there necessarily needs to be something. And there is this um, obviously big thing, comparatively speaking, like comparing, and it's comparable Yugoslav case with the Soviet one. We also there had large number of women fighting and combating and being kind of national heroes. But then after the war, not only that, this, uh, they did not disappear from cultural imagination totally, but th what was typical in both, ca both cases is that women totally were swiftly uh, erased from uh, the structures of uh, peacetime army. They were not uh, high ranking active uh, officers, not many, and with time they were disappearing more and more in both, both cases. So. Uh, ordinary peaceful time army uh, remained totally a male realm, which is in a way an interesting question. Why is that so? Why that's the obviously the only way to go despite this uh, kind of uh, really important intervention in the war time when, when women enter widely um, this uh, realm of combating and being soldiers. Yeah, um, the Yugoslav, Thank you so much. Yeah. The Yugoslav comparison is interesting. My understanding from one chapter I read is that uh, there's, it's similar in, um, in Vietnam where the North Vietnamese army had many female combatants um, or women in combat. And, and a few of them are remembered as heroes, but they of course are not in the peace. They don't remain in the peacetime army and they're a lot of the memories erased. Other questions? I have a, a quick question, if it's possible. I was wondering if there were, if you have any information on deterrence or punishments or other kind of measures that were in World War II on this front, and whether there were any reactions to them in letters written by males or females whether they were successful, whether any disdain towards having them. Thank you. So yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, there was, from what I have seen, um, sexual assault uh, was sometimes, uh, sometimes led to um, penalties. Indeed, I have, I have one case where an officer just uh, shot a guy out of hand for this without any military tribunal or anything. Um, officers could be um, disciplined for so-called um, sajitostva with women, so basically cohabiting. And um, this was largely a question of discipline and also um, the resentment it caused among the rank and file, the army, the people who managed morale were acutely aware how much the soldiers resented the officers privileged access to women, and, and they viewed it as undermining uh, unit cohesion and so on. Um, and, you know, there's some parallels here to the situation with the mass rapes 
uh, in Germany um, by Red Army personnel at the end of the war, where di there was discipline and serious discipline. Um, dis yeah, there, people were punished in serious ways. Um, but the, the reason uh, was a sense that this undermined discipline. There was also some concern that they didn't want to alienate uh, the German population under occupation. So um, I see something interesting on the chat, a question from, um, from Maria, uh, which I could take a stab at. Um, the question is, have you compared the attitude you describe in this work with the pieces of classical Soviet literature which deal with this issue? Um, the short answer is uh, no. <laughs> um, I know that in uh, memoirs, which I have read a fair number of, um, certainly in Soviet era memoirs, um, the issue was, to the extent women were talked about, the issue simply wasn't problematized. Um, women, much of women's experience was erased. Um, women were presented largely in the, in the role of medics and caretakers. Women combatants were ignored and so on. Um, I think that, um, for an earlier period, the novel Cement in 1923, which becomes ex post facto a classic of socialist realism, Cement, whatever its qualities as an overall literary work, um, is one of the deeper uh, socialist realist explorations of, of these um, gender dynamics. Um, the project of enlightening women, respect for women combined with the uh, with the primitive cult, quote unquote primitive culture, I guess we're not supposed to use the word of um, male sexual aggression. So that's, that's not a very adequate answer. It's what I've got. So we actually have a question from the Facebook live stream and I'll read that out right now. So from Felisa, she says, thank you for the interesting information. I have a question. A big part of today's and the last century's Russian cinema is the military topic. Do you think that the image of women of the war presented in the movies is accurate? You know, again, I, I have not looked at a lot of the film. I have read some articles on the film, on, on wartime films and films um, after the war. And from those, what I've gleaned is that in both cases, um, women were presented in either um, associated with um, vengeance against the Germans, whether as victims of atrocities or, or a, a woman whose motivation for combat was vengeance, or as, um, as objects of fun. Um, so there's a comedy called something like um, 100 women and a, and a man in which um, there, there's a guy who's assigned as an officer to a um, squadron of women pilots who are not portrayed in any way as, as serious combatants. So that's, uh, that's the best I can do on that. Uh, this is one of the things that I need to do is look at more of the wartime films. My, um, the thrust of my project really is to try and excavate um, to the extent possible, and obviously this is, can be a problem, actual experiences of people on the ground during the war rather than cultural interpretations. And um, that's one of the reasons why I'm, except for some, some good memoirs and oral histories, I'm sort of relentlessly focused on documents of the time, which have less processing, um, which have been processed less than uh, memoirs and so on. Other questions, <clears throat> comments? Um, okay, what we do have is a, we have a folder for all the general lectures, which often have slideshows, but in this case, if there's a, if the 
the speaker is willing to share a text of his draft with us just within the school, we'd be happy to post it there. If you don't want to, that's your, that's fine. Um, you can think about that. Um, and uh, why don't we then all turn our microphones on, unless there are any last questions, I don't see any in the box, um, please. And thank our speaker right now. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Thanks everybody. The schedule is posted for future future lectures. You can find it on the website. Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Have so a good much. night. You. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Matt. Oh, he left. <clears throat> I want to say bye. Hi, Alexander. Hi, Brad. <laughs> good to see you. We're not, we're not, can we turn this off for Facebook, please? <clears throat> and stop recording, please?